tried or used big data on OpenStack? Raise their hand. OK, so those who raise their hand, please come forward. Please come forward if you can, because we're actually going to ask you questions during the panel. Uh, so you're going to be somehow part of the panel. Okay, so, so the purpose of this, really, of this discussion is really to make it interactive. So I'm going to be the moderator. I'll uh, start with an introduction soon. Uh, but really, as a moderator, what I want to do is really uh, stimulate a discussion. Not more than that. We have a list of questions prepared. If you wouldn't ask question, but if I'll need to run through the entire list, that means that it's a failure. So please don't be shy and ask questions. Uh, so I'll start with an introduction. First of all, my name is uh, Nati Shalom, the CTO and founder of Gigaspaces. We've been in the big data space for almost uh, 13 years, uh, dealing with distributed computing problems. And some people already know the name, so I wouldn't uh, uh, add to that. Uh, we'll start with the right-hand side, Craig. Uh, uh, my name is Craig Tracy. Uh, I'm formerly the uh, cloud automation architect at uh, HubSpot. Uh, I recently took a new position at Blue Box Group building private cloud OpenStack. Um, but at HubSpot, I'm happy to speak, uh, my time at HubSpot, I'm happy to speak about our experiences, although I, I can't speak for what they'll be doing in the future. So. Cool. Ilya. Hello. My name is Ilya Elterman. I'm Director of Platform Engineering at Mirantis. <clears throat> I'm working on the projects like Savannah, Heat, and so on. And my team has actually founded Savannah, which is Hadoop and OpenStack. Cool. Hello. My name is Brent Holden with Red Hat. I'm the Chief Field Architect for our Eastern region. I work primarily with financial services customers and technology customers, helping them to build solutions around big data and OpenStack. Hi, I'm Bruce Matthews. I'm with uh, HB Cloud Services, a solutions architect in the Western region. I've uh, been working in data management since the early 70s, <laughs> so uh, I go back a rather long way. Uh, recently, I've been working with uh, Trove and Savannah to bring those things to our HP Cloud, which is the largest uh, OpenStack implementation in the U.S. Cool. Uh, so I think I'll start with the first question. Uh, does big data on the cloud make sense, given the regulation, given the performance uh, potential issues? Uh, this would be kind of a question to all panelists, and then we'll start to route questions. So again, this time we'll start with you, Bruce. Well, I think it depends. Yeah, that's uh, a good answer. As is, uh, starting, starting from that point of view, I think there are a few specific scenarios where it doesn't make sense, where uh, industry uh, uh, authorizations and things uh, stand in the way, uh, regulation and things of that nature. However, I think that there's a huge cross-reference of capabilities of big data that go all the way down to the fundamental mom and pop shop. That's really where I think big data can level the playing field with the large corporate entities all the way down to the small one and two uh, user needs and provide them the same data back. And those were, uh, that's where I think the economics will make it make sense. So in would, that the, level. would there be specific cases in which you would say this is not good for the cloud, and this would be a good case for the cloud. Is that size? Is that uh, yeah? I think it's. Security? I think it more instead of size. I think it more has to do with uh, the, the regulations requiring the data to be accessible only to a given uh, few. So uh, uh, you know, PCI compliant application services, HIPAA compliant application services. I think those are not really what I would use big data to to access. Okay, so we're not going to do that in order. Uh, just a second, uh, Ilya, your comment. Um, I do believe that in the most of the of the cases, big data is actually a good fit for the cloud, and cloud is actually helps to resolve some of the security restrictions because it separates of the concern of the distribution on the technical level, distribution of the different uh, actual workflows execution into different hypervisors, different virtual machines, so it's separated. I mean, it's almost on the physical level. And on big data, this high, high compliance and so on need to be resolved in a way. And the, most of the compliance is around logging and around the separation of the different multi-tenancy multi supports, the separation of the access with different tenants. I do believe that clouds actually can help 
The problem is that is a new field, there's a lacking of the tooling, but it will catch up. Good, so we got a slightly different perspective on, on that, and uh, Brent? Uh, so what I think is that um, cloud data makes sense for, um, for companies if you understand who's able to access the data. Now if you have, um, it, everyone has a different, different definition of cloud, and you know, some companies just consider an on-premise cloud for private, that is their cloud. Some mm -hmm. companies consider Amazon the cloud, some people consider OpenStack and Amazon the cloud. So it really depends on who's able to access it. You know, there's um, situations where you know, Red Hat has customers in the United States government where they're able to put their data onto an availability zone on Amazon. Now, you'd think of Amazon as a public cloud, but in this instance, uh, there's a very strict contract between the government and Amazon that the US government has very strict definitions of who has access to that data, and they have very strict access to um, who's able to access the equipment um, that that data resides on. So I think in that case, you, you're thinking about top secret data on a public cloud. That typically makes no sense. Uh, but it's because it's a very explicitly defined uh, parameters of who has access to that data. I think same thing goes for private cloud. You know, if you have uh, PCI or uh, healthcare compliant data, that's something where if you're on a private cloud and you're able to guarantee who has access to it, uh, that's where it makes sense. Where if you're not able to guarantee access to who has that data, uh, the regulatory compliance will absolutely kill you. So basically, I think you're extending, one, the definition of, of the cloud to private and public. In this case, there might be uh, a, a more granularity on how you deal with regulations. So for example, you could still run in the cloud, but it would be private in case you have a, a locality issue. And again, given, I think, all the news in, in, the, in the past weeks about uh, NSA and stuff, uh, yeah, not to mention other cases, um, I, I think that that, that is something that has to be considered. Now, Craig, you told me about the fact that you already had petabytes of data, for example, somewhere else, even though it was in the cloud. Uh, that is also a consideration on how you actually, how much data you already have. Uh, well, when it, you wasn't, actually it wasn't petabytes, it was yeah. uh, large numbers of terabytes. Okay, um, okay. But I, I'm, I'm probably not gonna dis disagree too much here. I think it kind of depends. Uh, for us though, having grown up in, as a cloud company from the very beginning, like literally the only hardware that we had was a half a rack and it served our wiki, I think. Um, so it made sense for us to be in the cloud. And what we, uh, you know, the benefits that we enjoyed from the cloud is the elasticity um, and the fact that we could uh, start new projects with, you know, without thinking about the capital expenditure that we have to, you know, take on to actually start a new project. Um, that said, we, I think, um, you know, extending the, the point made previously is that if you have compliance uh, issues, then you might want to think about running in a private cloud. And that's precisely what we had done. So uh, whether we're using public or private cloud, we were always uh, a cloud entity, and it made sense for us to be uh, But how, you know, how did you deal with, when, when you actually switch, let's say, from Amazon to uh, OpenStack, how did you actually move the data? Did you actually move it, or what was the actual? Yeah, so uh, for us, it, that amounted to, uh, we, we laid um, fiber between the two data centers, uh, we were in US East as well as Chicago, and, uh, and we would r uh, routinely move the data back and forth as we spun up new features inside the private cloud. Um, the intention is to eventually one day cut that cord and have everything uh, co-located uh, co -located in the private cloud in Chicago. So, mm -hmm. so basically what you said is that uh, you actually created a pipeline, a network pipeline, a dedicated network yep. pipeline to reduce it or at least increase the bandwidth so you could actually push more data. Yeah. And, and then I you continuously streamed it uh, so that um, the, the copies at least or the data will be continuously updated. In that case, you're talking about an incremental, not pushing the entire set Well, the no, time. so in our case, we actually did push the entire uh, data set at one point in time. So okay. we decided once we were ready to ramp up, we pushed the entire data set. Um, but as we migrated apps, we didn't, we moved the data, but we, we left, the, left the apps actually living in the public cloud. And as we solely migrated apps, I mean, you have to consider that we have many, many apps that are talking to many different sources of data. Um, so we use that pipe as kind of a bridge between our public cloud implementation and our private cloud imp implementation to kind of uh, manage the traffic as we were doing the migration. Okay, so, so again, just to be clear here, when uh, the migration that happens once after that one-time migration, how did, you still had to keep the two copies alive because there were systems No, we actually, so I, maybe it, I misspoke there. Was so it uh, the, an, a shift completely to a one location? So we, we shifted, uh, we have, maybe the confusion here is that we actually had multiple um, 
uh, Hadoop and HBase clusters. So uh, they all, all the data kind of interacts with each other. And uh, so what we would do is we'd selectively pick this cluster is moving to the private cloud. But at the same time, that, that the workloads that are happening in the private cloud actually have to talk back to the public cloud until we're ready to move those uh, workloads to the private cloud as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we left that low latency pipe between the two data centers while we were making that transition. And uh, I mean, for, so for someone that had our kind of footprint in the public cloud, you know, close to 2,000 instances, that's, uh, that's a big move. Yep, cool. So uh, maybe Ilya, um, let's talk about distribution. How much uh, distribution is an important thing uh, do the do do I can can I take uh, you know regular distribution from uh, Cloudera or Hortonworks or whatever and put it on on OpenStack without any modification or do I need specific optimization I know that you've done some work around that maybe you could share that and you have also a session I think uh, sometime today yeah I'm having I, I I'll try not to spend too much of the time talking like about some other features and I have the session today it's two forty and then. Breakout room one, I'm a little bit talking at more, more details and showing the demo. But in general, different distributions like Hadoop is like OpenStack. It's a huge big data platform with lots of the different components. And there are some of the core components and there are some of the integrated components. And different vendors pack them in, in some of different fashions. The core is similar, but the peripheral service may, may differ and the deployment topology may differ. So what we're working right now is to create a unified way to work with the core of the functionality uh, in a unified way in one API through the kind of creating the plugin mechanism and creating a unified way for integrating different management systems from different vendors, but still enable these uh, systems uh, embed their kind of specific features, their differentiation to, to the tooling so that end users can take advantage of, out of that. So I would say in general, they are kind of quite similar, but there are some of the different services and there are some different parameters that support it, different benefits uh, like Intel support and some hardware optimization and so forth, which will, de will, will depend on the details of how they operate. Yeah, now, uh, Bruce, yeah. yes, yeah, was, you I had was an say experience say with MapR on that regard. Yeah, and yeah that, that, uh, I mean, I think that there are actually lines of delineation, lines of demarcation between each one of the distributions as they stand today. I mean, uh, starting out with just the Apache and HDFS and MapReduce components, um, it, it, a lot of people it, it have this conception that I don't need to specialize my hardware to do anything for Hadoop. I can use my laptops and old, you know, HP computers and you know whatever I have available and s stick them together with a couple of switches and voila, I've got a, a in Hadoop environment. If you do that, you may actually be able to run Hadoop, but you won't be satisfied with the end results. So as a result, you really have to look at it as an application service and host the components of it in different ways on differently configured platforms. There are certain formulas, and I think this goes back to the point that Ilya was making, that you know, it's sort of a one virtual core, uh, four gig of RAM, one terabyte of storage as a data node. Yep, that, that will work for almost all of the distributions. However, if you're dealing with MapR, for example, which has the MapR FS, and it's trying to write an eight K byte block across those things, as opposed to the 64 K byte blocks in Cloudero or some other distribution, you actually have to go through and, and design the sizing the striping and all of those things, or the raw nature, dependent on which distribution you're working with. And it's founded on those sort of mathematical principles. You know, so so I physics. think that the general sentiment is that you could run it out of the regular distribution, but you wouldn't get the most out of it. The performance uh, Specifically will the performance aspect. Uh, there is also uh, the aspect of storage and anything. So uh, Brent, did you want to touch on that? And I know that Greg, you had specifically designed differently for that, so we'll start with Brent. Well, so I, I did want to address the point that the, the distributions are aggressively trying to differentiate from each other. And uh, some of that involves proprietary extensions, you know, the, the SQL interfaces on top of Hadoop, and some of that involves the storage integration layers uh, on below Hadoop. So some distributions will support the, uh, not just HDFS, but the Hadoop compatible file systems, the HCFS standard, and some won't. And so that will really limit your choice as to uh, 
what type of storage model that you will deploy. Um, the more upstream friendly distributions, so, you know, I'll call out uh, Hortonworks and Intel, I think that they're working more closely with upstream to not only define that HDFS standard and give customers alternatives to their storage, uh, but they're trying to uh, build a story around anti-vendor lock-in. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, you know, some of the other distributions, uh, you know, trying to lock customers into their HDFS platform and also their proprietary extensions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's up to you as a customer to figure out what's right for you and what model works and do you want to use their HDFS or do you want to use another uh, scale up file system that HDFS compatible. But is there a distribution like, that would you would say uh, better fit for cloud than OpenStack specifically and other distribution that are less optimized for that in your view? Well, I, th I think the, the distributions that are embracing cloud are probably the ones you're going to see more success with. I think mm -hmm. Hortonworks uh, embracing the Savannah project that Ilya is working on uh, with uh, Matt Fairley at Red Hat. I, I think that 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 type of embracing uh, cloud and that type of distribution model makes more sense, and I think that those are the those are the types of distributions that customers are going to lean toward towards when they use it on cloud. Good. And uh, Craig, you, you're using Cloudera, right? What so was your experience? Uh, uh, yeah, we were using Cloudera, but um, you know, as I mentioned before, we were early cloud adopters, and you know, things like Savannah did not even exist. So um, we were using the Cloudera distribution. Um, and I think there was a little bit of push towards the end to move more to upstream uh, straight Apache uh, so that we could actually add modifications that we wanted uh, in, into, the, uh, into the product itself. Uh, but yeah, for us it was strictly cloud error. And, and the reason why, uh, again, if I remember the discussion that we had was that you were running uh, on regular disk, right? Not on cloud storage, right? Yeah, so uh, when we were in public cloud, we were running on uh, strictly ephemeral disks. Um, and uh, in the move, in the migration towards private cloud, um, we were actually running on top of uh, the bare metal driver for Nova. And uh, in that case, we were just sitting literally on top of uh, 16 terabytes of raw disk. So. Okay, so in that case, you didn't have a potential conflict with the way storage is actually managed by a file system no. versus Hadoop that is yep. managing its own file system. Uh, Ilya, maybe you could uh, comment about your view of the, you know, uh, is there any conflict between having two storage systems sitting together in the cloud, or is it the, the approach that Craig was taking is the right approach to actually avoid storage in general? Um, first of all, on, on the previous conversation, just yep. make a quick point. So uh, I do believe that uh, in terms of the optimization of the Hadoop, it's not about the distribution being in the center, it's about the type of the workloads you're going to run are in the center. And you are optimizing, you're optimizing the set of the services you are picking. Based on that, you may choose different distribution and you're optimizing the actual parameters and what's kind of the value most of the actual parameter optimization. That's why we embed like Savannah support full list for each of the vendors. There's a mechanism to support full list of all of the parameters. And for some of the users, that might be extremely important to optimize the configuration of the Hadoop cluster for the actual workloads. So that's the, the, the key for mm -hmm. big data at this point because the whole big data story is a kind of a set of what you compromise because you can't do everything in a cost-effective fashion. So uh, on the storage side, I do believe that now kind of big data and cloud, I mean, big data is also cloud in a sense, but a kind of specialized clouds. And now there is kind of a period move of the general purpose cloud that solves the providing an infrastructure as a service in general. And what, when this clashing is happening, there is a kind of one central area, which is a kind of common, which is storage. And at least for the kind of big archival storage purposes, uh, clouds like OpenStack, general purpose clouds and big data will start to collaborate more and more and influence each other. So like uh, big data workloads ca can take advantage of the cloud storage and read the data directly from it because there's already a bunch of the data uh, that is stored over there like logs, you know, tweet, tweets and so forth. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, necessity of having the big data workloads and big data is all about bringing computation to the data will affect how the cloud storage engines are architectures and how like compute and storage nodes are collocated. Yeah, so I think we're touching a very big point here. I'll, I'll come with a few questions here, but I, I wanted to first of all see if there are questions from the audience uh, before I continue. Anyone have a question here for the panelists? Yes. Yeah, here is a mic there. Basically, I have a several Cloudera project in because I'm Cloudera partner and 
I have an open stack in my computer office and my client mostly a government with the cloud stack. So we make a, we starting with a small project in the Hadoop and the Java and everything and on the open stack because we can make a virtual machine in my lab yeah, in every project. So after that we move to the cloud stack and now we are working to make sure that the Cloudera have the independent rather than on top of the cloud stack to make it faster and they have manage their own storage. That's my architecture in our projects. I think we have four or five, something like that. And now we are like integrating everything, the Cloudera, because we use a lot of Cloudera. And your question is? One project and one question is, is it, this is a good one or not? Because I can see, uh, uh, we have a problem with uh, how to make it faster, and if the cloud there, uh, the cloud stack have problem, we follow the problem. So, I want so, to know. So the question is whether running Cloudera on OpenStack is yeah, good or enough. Or or they are running cloud stack. So the first recommendation: switch over to OpenStack. Switch over to yeah. OpenStack. <laughs> right. Start there. And and the the actual question was. Uh, Tell me if I'm summarizing it correctly. Uh, would be would running Cloudera on OpenStack has uh, any performance issues, or need? Uh, yeah, excuse me. Maybe, uh, I was yep. going to say so that I think, really, this goes back to something that Ilya was talking about earlier in terms of the workload driving the use of a distribution, not the other way around. So it isn't that Cloudera may not be, you know configured as well as you'd like and things like that. But it might actually be <laughs> that it, using Cloudera to satisfy your workload isn't the fastest to run. And the only way that you can actually figure out whether that's the case is to go gauge the number of slots that are being used for specific tasks and whether you're getting contention for uh, the available resources to do different tasks, whether you're timing out on data nodes of the task having to be repeated to get done, things of those nature, uh, that nature. And then if you are, that will point to the portion of the configuration that's constraining it. And as a result, then you'll be able to analyze what you would need to fix, which may point to a different distribution to run faster, if that makes sense. So if I summarize it, by what you're saying is that there is one option of distribution, second options of parameterization within each distribution on how you could optimize it. And if you optimize it for the, and, and there is no one optimization for all workloads, you have to optimize for a specific workload. So it looks like yes. uh, the answer is that you should be able to get the performance that you're uh, looking for either by the choice of distribution or through the configuration. And cloud is not necessarily the bottleneck uh, in that space. I think that's gonna be and yeah. If I may, yes. I even disagree with that. I mean, okay. cool. uh, I disagree with the fact that workloads is really is really kind of that much drive the choice of the distribution. I do believe that all of these distributions are trying to solve the similar problem in different ways. Some do vendor looking, some not. But almost any problem which is at, at all solvable with like Hadoop per se can be solved with any of the e any of the distributions. Just a matter of different type of the optimization. And maybe in some cases the cost would be slightly higher, but in general they are not that much different in terms of the what the end result is, and it's absolutely possible to solve all of the applicable problems. Yeah, I'm sure that the distribution vendors here, if there are any, uh, would disagree with that, but uh, we'll keep that. Uh, so just uh, Bruce and Mike, right? Uh, you said that you raise your hand when I asked the question yeah. of if you're using. Uh, so maybe yeah. you could elaborate on that. So we're we're using uh, Susan. Yeah, yeah, we're using a uh, Cloudera. So it's, we just have a chef, chef script. Uh, the hardest part actually was, was identifying and, and what, the nodes. And when you're saying we? Oh, uh, 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 data tactics, we're a data engineering company. Data engineering company. Yes, yeah, so we do okay. analytics on the data. It doesn't matter, you know, we could do it from Excel to Hadoop. Okay. Uh, and everything in between. Uh, so we're looking at the analytics. The question for you guys is, um, have you done comparisons between, okay, here's my deployment with my sample data set on OpenStack, theoretically optimized, provides an equivalent on, uh, you know, hard OS to hard iron. Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually have a, a, a really uh, uh, gr 
grateful position within Hewlett Packard to be able to take what they call app system, for example, uh, which are the Hadoop infrastructures, reference architectures that we produce, and, and, and deploy using similar data sets uh, against OpenStack. And a actually, I, don't, I use other tools for deployment like OR, or, or uh, 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 Savannah, or those kinds of things. But, but, but the end result is basically a similar configuration. And then I actually run quite a few of the, you know, word count pi, TerraSort, TerraGen, uh, those kinds of things, Cloudburst. Um, there's a new one out there called YCSB that I've started using. It's more like an OLTP kind of thing. Yeah, that's the Yahoo benchmark, uh, for those who are not familiar. Yes, yep. and, and I compare results, and quite frankly, I can actually, dependent on the number of nodes that I, I have to generate more nodes because the, the individual data nodes are smaller in my cloud than on the big iron that I can. So Bruce, is it faster on the cloud or slower on the cloud? Uh, it, it is faster in Apsys, uh, which is in Apsys, which is bare yeah. metal. Okay, right. But. No, it's, it, it's more like 15%. More than 50%? Okay, so you've seen 20%? You've seen between, okay. And yeah. you've seen more than 50%? No, 15. 15. 15, okay. 15 to 20 percent is probably a good figure to go with is the differentiators between and, them. And hold on a second here. Uh, Craig, you mentioned something different when you moved from Amazon to your bare metal on OpenStack, right? Yeah, so uh, again, it's not apples to apples, so we're not cloud to cloud, you know, or exactly, yeah, cloud yeah. to cloud. Uh, but moving from hypervisors uh, in a public cloud setting back to bare metal, uh, we were seeing 10 close to 10x, 10x efficiencies, both in terms of cluster size as well as the workloads. And that was that may be specific to our workload, so. Right, so here we got actually 10x, and, and I, if I may add to that, I mean, the benchmark and the reasons why there are differences from what I could see, there the are different way in which you could measure the difference. One is that you do apple to apple, in that case you might see the range of 20%. Yes. But uh, if you optimize for the specific workload, for example, in a cloud you have only certain uh, choices of hardware and disk and so forth. And in bare metal, for example, you could choose completely different things. So you not necessarily have to have Apple to Apple, you could actually move to something different. In that case, the difference, just because you have more choices, might be significant up to the point of 10X, as it was mentioned. And I've seen more cases. Right, yes. IO. Yeah, I, I think that's the general sentiment in the community that you know virtualization is not particularly designed for I/O heavy workloads. Um, I think with with Hadoop, it's unique that uh, you can have the I/O sit over the network, so you can access that uh, using a Hadoop compatible file system. So that that sort of uh, that allows you to keep your um, you know your data on fast IOP machines uh, in your compute on just that abstraction layer for virtualization. There are situations where you'd want to co-locate your uh, your data with those. Uh, uh, with those uh, CPU intensive workloads, you know, in that case, you know, you're, you will see an improvement over uh, virtualization just by the nature of if you have high IOP jobs, you'll always see an improvement on bare metal. I don't know if it's uh, 10x, uh, but certainly it's much better performance. Yes. And um, we are starting off with bare metal, obviously. Um, and we have been talking to the vendors where uh, we know based on our workload, we are going to push their limits, uh, the different big data vendors itself. And the question is, um, given a company like Symantec, which because of the security uh, way in which we work, we obviously own our own data centers and we want to be that way. Uh, you know, the, the public cloud is not a, a luxury that we can afford. Uh, so given that, um, what are the benefits of actually putting big data on OpenStack other than being able to maybe migrate from um, you know, one particular hardware to another? Uh, am I missing something? I just wanted to understand Excellent that. question. So the question, just to repeat, uh, if, I'm if 
the recommendation is to use big data and bare metal, what's the benefit of running on OpenStack in general and not, if I may, uh, running without OpenStack? Yeah, because in, in, in the public cloud, or the private cloud, I can Right, right, right. On a private cloud, private if I'm on private cloud and I'm using, uh, let's say, Hadoop that already kind of manages itself, what benefit do I get by running it on OpenStack versus running it without OpenStack? Uh, so I, I yeah. can yeah I can touch on that a little bit. For, so for us, having grown up in the cloud, uh, we had all of our tooling and our provisioning is is based. We we build custom uh, tools in house that do all of our provisioning. The nice thing about OpenStack uh, using the bare metal driver was that we can use that same kind of control plane. We didn't have to rely on tools like Razor or Cobbler or any of these Pixie Boot types of things. We treat bare metal precisely the same way we would treat a normal instance in a public cloud, which is completely disposable. So. Uh, you know, if we don't like it, we kill it and we spin up a new one. And, and that was the driver for us, is that we didn't want to manage all of these disparate types of tooling and use the same so tools that we It was the built. consistent management aspect mm -hmm. in which you don't look at big data as a completely separate island. It's part of a system and within the context of a system, it makes sense to have a consistent way to manage the resources. I think that's a summary of, a good summary. Um, uh, Brent, did you want I, to add I, that? I, I actually, okay. want, if Someone I may, make, okay. yeah, yeah, want to make a comment. Sure. On this, so I'd actually also cross correlate the previous question. So regards the, on the benchmarking, right? So when we are talking about the performance of just one aspect, and actually, I mean, we are working for the enterprises at the end, at the end, and what is drives is how much you pay versus how much you get. So like performance and pure like flops, it's not necessary that really end result that you are striving to. It's how much of the performance you get per dollar spent, and you might want to account all of the electricity, data power, and so forth. So, so for example, uh, if I extend to what you're saying, if you have a sporadic workload, even if you have, let's say, right. 10 or 10 times the machines, but you could kill them after an hour, it's gonna be more effective than having a machine that does 10 times, but you keep it 24 by seven. Right, uh, and even- and Just as an example, yes, right? Yes, and even, and it's true, it's for the private data, private cloud <laughs> case for the bigger companies, uh, you can mix and match different type of workloads, not just different type of Hadoop workloads, but different type of the, all of the workloads in the one cloud and use the available bare metal in much more efficient fashion. Even it's 15, 20, or 50% degradation, and which I don't personally agree. I do believe that right now it should be along the lines 10 to 20%, and it's getting better. The hypervisor is getting better, like there's PCI pass-through stuff, the cloud management system getting better, so it will, Reasonably quick go to very little, <coughs> if nothing. I mean, I've, I've even seen the uh, cloud uh, workload optimization on the right, uh, even better when there's so lots of- So would you recommend using bare metal on OpenStack or not? It, it's depends or on the work, it depends on the workload. Okay, so your default would be hypervisor and only if you don't have, uh, what would be your recommendation there? Uh, I mean, the bare metal provisioning is a part of cloud, is a part of OpenStack. Right. So, um, and it's just a flavor of the type of the on-demand resource you're spanning off. It's more expensive type of the flavor, like in the Amazon you have like more expensive instances. So you can spend like small or large virtual instance and it's cost, at the end it's all about the cost. It's cost your company whatever, like 10 cents per minute. Or you can spend the bare metal machine from the pool of the bare metal provisioning pool and it will cost I don't know, like two dollars. So it's a cost versus performance yes. uh, ratio. So if you're less worried about cost, then you'd go with performance, and in that case, bare metal right. would make sense. If you're more worried about cost and willing to sacrifice performance, then virtualized instances might be a better choice. Right. Good answer. Yes, uh, there are many questions uh, here. Uh, yeah, I have let's, a question. Uh, I'll let, uh, 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 one of the problems that uh, I was thinking of was that- if you could uh, say your name and- Oh, uh, name's from. Jeff Applewhite. Uh, I work with uh, NetApp. I work with our Hadoop implementation. One of the problems that I was thinking of with, uh, with Hadoop on the cloud is uh, the HDFS file system is optimized for physical location as far as storage and as far as network. You know, a copy gets made and then gets copied into a distant rack that then gets copied to a, a third, normally in, in a three right. rep count. So how do you work around that in the cloud? I mean, there are a bunch of options. Just use an ephemeral local storage. And that's, that's the local drive. And the most of the hypervisors nowadays do the right so optimizations. So in that case, you bypass the cloud storage using the local uh, In that case, you bypass the cloud storage, right? Right, and let, uh, and let 
HDFS basically become this storage All right. uh, for that. I mean, there, there are different cases. There's different use cases. If you're running, you, you, you can run the permanent cl Hadoop cluster on top of the, uh, on top of the OpenStack per se, if you like to. And you can take even here the benefits of being able to elastically change the size of the cluster in just a matter of the clicks on, on demand in, in no time and have the data stored in the actual cluster and have like HDFS located on the local drives. And there's a bunch of the work on the Nova side, which is happening on, uh, there would be, I, I believe in the Havana time frame, it's already possible to map like Spindle to the tenant. So there's no competition of the different tenants to the right access to one like hard drive Spindle. Mm -hmm. Or you can use, I know like SSD drives. I mean, there's, there, it's, it's not a silver bullet, it's all of the, it's, it's a platform, you can configure it to work best in your case. So, so I think uh, part of the answer to your question is that you have choices either in the cloud or in the cloud and uh, probably solutions for most of the options, it's mostly the option that you choose, not necessarily you know, kind of a, a one answer to that question. So uh, Bruce, I think, uh, and Brent, do you add uh, a different perspective or? Well, I, I, I think it comes down to data locality, I think is the general uh, question, right? It's how do you guarantee data locality? And I think, you know, things like software-based storage, like uh, Red Hat storage have uh, the features like NUFA, which is the non-uniform file access. It's essentially like NUMA for storage. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that will allow you to get data locality. Um, but that also... Uh, Means how does that the data like, locality works with? So that you know, that, that, that means like things like Nova H have to be aware that these things exist. Yeah. So I know that those types of uh, you know OpenStack becoming rack aware is something that is going on within Triple O right now. Um, Nova becoming uh, more aware of the storage is effort that's going on right now. So I think you know to the point right now is how do you guarantee data locality? You know I, I think there's not a great way to do that right now. I think that a lot of the things that we're talking about are problems that you know we're trying to address as a community. So if I could just make one comment with that. So we, we had this problem with the bare metal and uh, one nice thing that we have access to with OpenStack, especially when running with the bare metal driver is that we could change it. And we had this precise problem where we needed rack awareness in order to, to make sure that we had redundancy across racks. Um, so we just changed it and uh, we added rack awareness and uh, we actually built an entire GUI on top of it so that any developer could go to the GUI and say, I want a new node in this rack because I know that I have to stripe across these racks. In the public cloud, it's, you know, we did the quick and dirty where, you know, an AZ is a rack, right? So. Uh, and also, in Savannah, we already move a step forward toward that. Uh, there is no way for, to learn about uh, rack distribution of the compute nodes uh, from OpenStack itself. But if you give the Savannah simple configuration file, it will analyze it combined with the information where the actual virtual machine is located that is taken from OpenStack, combine this with information where the Swift data located and pass it over to Hadoop so Hadoop scheduler can take advantage of this information and enable data locality for the Hadoop workloads. It's, it's what it's so basically you're saying that in the pipeline there is in each step there is some level of data locality and each tier takes care of the data locality in its own pipeline. So for example, there is no data locality between Swift and Hadoop, but the routing of the data is somehow related. Is that what you're saying? Or are you saying something different that I didn't get? <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm trying to say that even right now, like with the help of Savannah, uh, you can provide the information from where the actual data located on the different levels. Uh, virtual host, physical host hypervisor rack. Okay. It's all, tools like Savannah already can collect this data and pass over to the Hadoop scheduler. Oh, so it. so if, yeah. if the actual data locality exists, I mean, if you'll put all of your data in uh, Swift, which is stored in a separate rack, whatever information we collect, there's no way to get data locality, it's just separate. But if you design a cloud in such a way that Swift nodes, for instance, in at least in the same rack, uh, so there's already tooling exists that collect this information and pass over to Hadoop and then Hadoop scheduler like in a native Hadoop fashion, can take advantage out of that and schedule the workloads close to the data. Got it. Did that okay. answer your question, by the way? You got an answer? Good. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just wait for the speaker because I, I'm not hearing you. 
So uh, I would just like to ask, like there is, uh, you say that there is 15 to 20 percent overhead uh, comparing to bare metal to visual, uh, virtualization. You see any big difference uh, between different hypervisors, uh, KVM um, or Xen or SXI uh, in uh, data nodes uh, with a lot of uh, disk I overhead. So overhead with the hypervisor. Yeah, so I, I, I was just going to say it, it's, that's only really for some workloads because I think Craig had mentioned earlier that it, it's really kind of workload dependent as to whether that's 20% or whether it's 10x, which it could be. Um, and I think that, that from the hypervisors that I've had an opportunity to deal with, and believe me, I, I've you know, done the, the Hyper-V and, and VMware and, and KVM uh, from our, our standpoint to look at, and I've, I've sort of found that KVM for the Ubuntu platform that we're hosted on is actually the, the fastest out, mm -hmm. of, out of those platforms. But that's sort of personal and empirical experience. It's not really, I haven't studied it. Just to qualify the 10X, we were, I mean, we weren't talking about hypervisor to bare metal strictly, right? We were also talking public cloud to private cloud with noisy neighbors, noisy networks. So, I mean, that's a huge difference. Uh, so the question, uh, did, does anyone else have anything to add about the choice of hypervisor? Uh, actually, on yes. this 10X, probably part of the reason that in Amazon environments, you have much less of the control of the actual Hadoop cluster configuration. You even really know, unless you're just running your own clouds. Yeah, we were. Ah, you yeah. were, okay. I'm referring to EMR. Yeah, no, we were not, we never used We, we made a, kind of like a, a strict stance that we don't use any of those kind of uh, higher level services, no EMRs, no RDS. Mm -hmm. um, we built all in-house. So. And that, that's what allows you to actually move to OpenStack in the first place, right? Yeah, because and you know, and that doesn't discount the value of something like Savannah or Trove. Um, it's just a, a design decision that we had made early on so that we, you know, in 2007, we had no idea that these things would actually be, you know, we were even predating EMR and RDS. So. Um, it was just a design decision for us. So anyone else have any experience with the hypervisor before Mike, we, uh, we're sorry. Yeah, uh, so we, your we actually had yeah. similar results and we oh, used the, the KVM on Ubuntu. Uh, question for you guys, so it, it came up earlier, but it's the why do I put uh, 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 my Hadoop uh, <coughs> onto OpenStack? Uh, I'll tell you my reasons and tell me if they're valid or not. So one, uh, we work in a sort of, uh, you know, a DevOps, theoretically, shop. <laughs> Uh, you know, so the local developers are using Vagrant, poof, you know, locally they, they can test out their algorithm. They can run it into test, you know, poof, it instantiates uh, in OpenStack. And, you know, this would be like a small cluster with, you know, a small amount of data so that we can review and test the algorithms. In a production environment, uh, right now on the hard iron systems, you could get as low as 4% utilization of that server. Right. And, and we just can't afford that many servers. Uh, so one of the things we were thinking of was that OpenStack may allow us to, to make use of the no ops. You know, it's a, you know, nothing, 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 map reduce. You know, nothing, 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 map reduce. Uh, behavior, uh, uh, both networking, I.O., and CPU. So A, question there is, is that a valid assertion? And it kind of gets into a bit of the scheduler uh, and scheduling of all of this. And is that something that would need to be expanded uh, and or have you guys looked at uh, how Yarn and or Mesos yeah, so, impacts so this? I'll, I'll have to interrupt here because we've actually run out of time. Uh, I know that there's a lot Five of more questions. Five more minutes. <laughs> Five more minutes? Okay, yeah. good. So we got time for one uh, for, for an answer for that. Well, so um, I guess I'll answer that. So I think, I think the questions that you're asking are in general, why virtualize? Um, you know, consolidation and elasticity. I think OpenStack provides the ultimate elasticity allows you to uh, rapidly build up uh, workloads and automate, and then rapidly tear down. And I think that's, uh, that's what uh, customers are asking for when, uh, when you're running a, a large cluster of machines and you're looking at that utilization saying, well, how do I get better use out of this? You know, they want to be flexible with their workloads. And I think that that's the strongest point that OpenStack, uh, or the strongest uh, benefit that OpenStack can give you is that it provides that elasticity. And I think that the, the whole model is built around elasticity. Why? you know, having an API to integrate based on Savannah, and, and it, it makes it easy to do that. And so I think that's why you do it. Just an add-on question would be, with the over-allocation, and on top of that, the actual, 
with the over allocation on top of that, right. do you actually get the, the performance that you really want by over allocating, right. by really mm -hmm. diving into it? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're talking about machines that have very low utilization, then, you know, uh, yeah, over allocation is not going to be a huge problem, right? But if you're talking about machines that have high utilization, you know, 50, 70 percent, and then you're allocating 16 to 1, that would be a much bigger problem. So I think that that's a, you know, that, that's a problem that, you know, it's an obvious, obvious problem, right? An obvious answer. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, people have to be aware of. And I think that, you know, uh, Salometer and the monitoring that's coming with an open stack, yeah. that'll help to alleviate that type of problem. Uh, other questions from the audience? Uh, I, 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 I made the last comment on this. So the bigger this, the cloud it is, the more benefits of the cost effectiveness you get. It's a kind of fitness club problem. They subscribe like, I don't know, 10,000 people on a yearly, fairly cheap kind of, you know, like payments uh, to attend the 10,000 or 500 uh, maximum capacity facility. And the idea is that they're never coming at the same time. So if, if you're building the system and all the workload is coming at the same time, it's probably, I mean, you're in trouble. It's ineffective either way on bare metal and the cloud. But if you have a bunch of different workloads, and I mean, statistically, you can combine them, them in a way that all of the time they consume all of the, well, most of the capacity, mm -hmm. that's the key. And that's why, actually, you need the, this cloud system in the first place. So it's not just a matter of distribution, different Hadoop tenants, right. it's all the type of the workloads. Good. So uh, again, are there any other questions, last question from the audience? So in that case, I'd, I'd like to kind of uh, conclude. I think that, uh, first of all, thank you for the panelists for uh, joining me for this uh, panel and for all the questions. I think there was a lot of questions and I'm sure we haven't answered everything. Uh, and B, uh, you know, feel free to follow up with the panelists after we finish. Uh, if I may uh, conclude, I would say that uh, big data represents a relatively complex workload and the type of workload that requires a lot of choices on how you can run it. Uh, and I think that if we look at the industry right now in OpenStack specifically, now we have more choices that actually can accommodate the type of workload that big data requires from the choice of private versus public to the choice of uh, uh, bare metal uh, that I think is a big uh, difference in, in, the case of, uh, in the case of OpenStack. And once we have that uh, flexibility in the system, uh, there's almost no restrictions on why we wouldn't choose uh, to run big data on OpenStack. I think that would be something that we can all agree. Cool. And thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll conclude with that.